Hey, all you crazy sci-fi fans. It's time for your daily dose of insanity. Over here at the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast with your hosts, J.R. Handley and me, Chris Winder. Just two nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions. A place where the sky's the limit, space is the place, and nerds run the world. Without further ado... So today we're going to interview uh, one of our friends and partners with a podcast, Josh Hayes. Yay. He's an author. Woohoo! Golf clap. Uh, he's an author, uh, a police officer with uh, the EOD teams in his undisclosed location. I still say he's a 12 year old girl hiding in a bonker, but he, he tells me it's not, it's not true. It's um, not true. I told you that already. He was a Zoomie, so it might be true. <laughs> Speaking of zoomies, he's a he's a U.S. Air Force veteran where he was a security forces, and while it says SF, yeah, they're just rent a cops, right? <laughs> we, we we like to call uh, ourselves security services because we do we do way more cleaning than we do anything else. <laughs> oh, outstanding, God. outstanding, and he's a, obviously we mentioned our our pairing up with the Keystroke Medium YouTube live show, and he is one of the co-hosts, the one, the only Josh Hayes. True, indeed. Well, hey, uh, thanks for letting me on the show, man. It's it's great to to talk with you guys, and I'm I'm honored that you guys wanted to have me on. That's yeah, neat. welcome. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I've been sort of uh, Facebook stalking you for a while, um, <laughs> so you know, um, about a year ago, I'd say probably, I found your YouTube channel. Um, I was I had already signed my contract with Tim Taylor for the Sleeping Legion stuff, and. Uh, he's friends with Nathan Heistead and some of the uh, Ralph Kearns and some of the other British sci-fi authors. Yeah. And so I knew about the um, uh, was it the Explorations through the Wormhole anthology, right? And so you had all of those mini like five minute episodes where people were talking about where their stories came from, and so that's actually how I found you. Oh, very uh, nice. Back then, and then you know I've made most of the live shows. At least I did when they were on Thursdays. When you guys, when your life is changed and you started doing mondays during the day that became a little bit harder right but, uh, but i still listen to all of them they're awesome um and then your co-host who's also a local to you in that bonker um is scott <laughs> boone so yes. and um so the reason we have this partnership is when chris and i started thinking about how can we market ourselves and have fun uh, and learn stuff and get an excuse to say we're working when we're drooling over technology <laughs> um, is we said, well, let's start a podcast. And so when we needed help, we called 911. No, I lie. We called Josh Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So we um, – what the podcast, what we're envisioning this this partnership is basically we're sort of a KSM, Keystroke Medium affiliate podcast. Um, so we partner with them. We're sharing there because they're nice and generous and don't make us monitor a million Facebook groups. But uh, we're sharing their Keystroke Medium uh, Facebook group if you want to interact with us, which is why that's in the show notes every week. Um, and basically, you know, they scratch our back with publicity and we do the same. Um, you'll probably hear because he sponsors some of the episodes, commercials for uh, the many, many sci-fi goodness novels written by Josh. Um so that's sort of where we are. So uh, aside from talking about that, and I promise I don't hog the mic all the time. <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> I let Chris say, Chris said three words or something yesterday. Yay. Uh, <laughs> so instead of just um, blabbering on about it, why don't you uh, say what, what you envision from this, this partnership? And then we could talk about the fun stuff like your books. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Keystruck Medium is um, my business. It's my company. It's it's not just a uh, it's not just a podcast. We do um, we do uh, charity work. Uh, we're gonna do a uh, uh, we're starting an annual um, awards program, uh, kind of like the Dragon Award, except uh, um, not that prestigious as yet. <laughs> Uh, that'll be that'll be starting this year. Um, we do a lot of things with Nathan at Woodbridge Press, where we're trying to to, to put together new things for new authors. Um, and so we did. We started as a podcast, but we've we've grown into several uh, uh, several different areas uh, as we've progressed over the last couple of years. And um, one of those areas is wanting to um, help other, uh, people that are in our space, 
um, by sharing our audience and sharing our, our know-how and we're not experts by any means, but um, we have a lot of uh, loyal fans and a lot of loyal uh, people that, that listen and, and watch. And um, we like to extend a, uh, a helping hand to to anybody at that i think that's part of uh, the indie industry as a whole when you talk about indie indie publishing or self-publishing or, or anything that has to do with that um most people that are involved are very apt to say yes i, I want to help or I, can i do something for you and that that that's, that's part of the reason that uh, we started the podcast so um uh, we our first uh, affiliate partnership was with Chuck and his uh, Chuck Manley and his Story Shots podcast. Um, now Chuck is actually a guest host on the show uh, or co-host. Uh, we host, we don't host, but we have uh, uh, page space on our website where his show is featured, uh, and we're, obviously we want to do the same for you Appreciate guys. That. Um, to just to give you uh, some more space because the, the hardest thing in this industry to do is to get readers or listeners or viewers. And if we can do something small, like put us on, put you on our website or, or allow our, our um, Facebook uh, followers to, to jump over your guys's podcast or push people in your direction. That that's what we want to do. So. so, so what kind of authors do you interview? Is it only indie or only traditional or both? We do, we do both. And, um, we predominantly try to stick to the, uh, science fiction fantasy group set, uh, if you will, but we, we do interview everyone. I mean, we've had, uh, uh several romance authors on last season. Um, we've had a several, uh, just regular fiction authors. We do traditional and indie. We've had, uh, you know, Richard Fox, mm -hmm. we've had, uh, um, David Weber, Peter F. Hamilton, um, uh, Jay Allen was on the show. Uh, 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 so we, we like to bounce back in between. And uh, uh, we've had um, cover artists on the show. We've had uh, Tom Edwards, who does uh, really spectacular science fiction covers. Um, Tom was actually our first covers for a cure uh, artist where we raised, uh, raised almost $5,000 for Parkinson's research in, in uh, the UK. Um, we're going to do another covers for a cure with, uh, Christian Kalis. Um, and he's going to come on the show, uh, this month in a couple weeks, a uh, couple weeks. Uh, and, um, uh, so we, we like to, we like to bring, uh, something, uh, a little bit of everything to the show. And, you know, there's a lot of shows that are just straight question and answer interview shows. Um, there's a lot of shows that are solely focused on marketing or solely focused on craft, and you get that enough with those shows that we think that we can do something a little bit different with ours and ours. We like to create an atmosphere where people can basically just come and geek out about their stuff, whether it's cover design or, I mean, we had, um, we had Luke Daniels, who's an audiobook narrator on, uh, and that show was a lot of fun mm. listening to jump between <laughs> right. voices and, uh, um, you know, so we, we like to do a little bit of everything and, and, uh, have conversations with people and, and the feedback that we've received from our guests and, uh, from our audiences that they like that stuff too. So we're going to, so we're going to continue. So, uh, Chris found the KSM through, um, through me when we were setting this up, cause he actually is pretty active in the dead robot society. That's with Terry Mixon and Paul, mm -hmm. uh, equally. Um, yeah. So that's where we met. We're both um, Patreon supporters of, of the show. Um, and so we have, when we set this up and I showed him, uh, your guys, the, I basically, we mirrored our, we have what we call the Amazon rule for if we'll talk to an author is if Amazon says it fits a sci-fi, we're, we're good with it. You know, sort of like what, what was it? The Scrabble dictionary analogy Chris used, you know, you have to agree with that's what dictionary right. it's, in the, it's a word. Well, Right. right. And so we did the same thing with Amazon. So I think, Chris, that one of the things that uh, for the rule for the KSM is we have the the genre specific. There's is does the writer have a pulse? <laughs> <laughs> OK, we will talk to them. really. So yeah, absolutely. Have you ever done any children's book in the age of the zombie? 
the only the only caveat is uh, we have not had, and I don't think we have any plans to have uh, any. <laughs> I was going to uh, ask <laughs> authors. Um, now, if that's something where the the uh, the author is doing that as kind of like a ghost deal, and that's not part of his main. Like we're not going to have somebody on to talk about his erotica <laughs> novels, but if he's a sci-fi, if he's a military sci-fi author, but he writes erotica on the side to make a little money, are you talking uh, about Richard Fox? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> as far as I know, Richard does not write erotica, but uh, not not that he's told me anyway. Okay, uh, <laughs> we'll have to ask him. Yeah. So, but the um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. That's one of the things that sets you guys apart as well. Aside from your willingness to talk to anybody in the in the industry. So if they, you know, they haven't interviewed that I know of, but I, Josh has talked about, you know, he'd be willing to talk to agents and what they're looking for, or cover art, well, cover artists, illustrators for like graphic novels or comic books. Like basically, if it's in the written word genre, they're they're pretty game. It's just, you know, the indies seem to be the most willing to reach out and, and put themselves out there these days. You don't have to go through a whole lot of paperwork uh, or make a whole bunch of phone calls to get a hold of them and talk your way through an agent and a, right. and a secretary and everybody else. And actually, in, it, you know, over the last uh, almost three years of, of uh, booking guests, uh, you're right. It's sometimes it's, it's ridiculously hard to get a hold of a traditional author where you go to their website and they have no, personal contact. I mean, I've reached out to several, like, uh, for instance, I, I, I reached out to Timothy Zahn, uh, on over Facebook messenger, uh, because I couldn't find really any better place to, to contact him. Now he did respond to me and he was very, uh, uh, open to coming on the show. But if, unfortunately when I contact him, he was right in the middle of doing publicity and tours for one of the star Wars books. So he didn't have any time to come on. Um, but with Indies, uh, nine times out of 10, they'll have a, Hey, send me a message yep. on my email or my website or email here or whatever. And you can just pop, send it off. And, uh, and I found also that, um, talking with, uh, both indie and traditional authors and, and, uh, sometimes we get a lot more out of, uh, indie authors that are not, uh, not beginning, but not set in their ways, um, that are still learning and still recognizing that they're learning and still uh, are excited about what they're actually right. doing craft wise. And so we, a lot of times we'll get a lot more uh, meat, if you will, out of the conversation than just talking to a traditional public uh, author who has, who basically has his spiel memorized, right? Like he'll, he'll say the same thing or she'll say the same thing in every interview and you don't generally get anything new or exciting out of that. And so, um, well, there yeah. are some indie authors like that. Like, I don't know if you've, you've interviewed Nick Cole, but I, I'm convinced he's a cyborg because a lot of <laughs> stories and then those pictures he posts on his Facebook page with him and his donut obsessions, but I never yep. see him eating the donuts. Yep. Saying. I have never seen a picture, you know, where he where he's actually <laughs> doing human things. So, uh. you know, Nick Cole. Every time he's been on the show, uh, he's been in his car, and we we like to joke that he's on stakeout <laughs> every time he he comes on the show because every time he's in his car and it's at night, and it's because his wife is an opera singer. And actually, we met him in Las Vegas when we went to to twenty books to fifty k in Vegas this year and had dinner with him and Jason and and Richard and his wife and Christian was there too. We're, we're both yeah. of us are, are hoping we can make it next year to the uh, to twenty books to fifty k. Um, Absolutely, gala if you would next year. I tell you, it's 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 a blast. As soon as the registration opens, I will register. It's the it's one of the cheapest conferences you go to. The most expensive thing is the room and the flight. The che- the the conference is, I think, still going to be a, like under one hundred and fifteen dollars wow. for four days. Uh, we're one of the cool things that we're doing, uh, and I haven't talked a lot about this on our show, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll do a first here, if you will. Um, our Woo! our reader, our KSM Reader's Choice Award. Uh, series um, that we're previewing or um, starting this year, we're going to award at uh, 20 books to Vegas 18. We're going to have, uh, we're going to have one of the rooms and we're going to do actual, an actual presentation there um, 
at the conference. So it's, it's, it's going to be a really neat thing. Uh, we're going to have actual physical, you can hold in your hand awards, um, that are going to be, uh, customized with your novel's name and your name and what category it was in. And, uh, so that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. So if anything, go there for awesome. that, because I think that's going to be a blast. We'll, we'll have to do that. So, but the, um, but yeah, we, um, one of the things you mentioned that he's in the Nick Cole in the car, just because it's funny. Um, so he does a, um, D and D type deal where they, they YouTube it live where they're playing via like a Skype conference type deal. And right. I mentioned that I had tried and he was, cause he, he's really big on, you know, are these people really nerds and D and D fans or are they the posers that, you know, now that it's cool, <laughs> they say they did, but they've never actually played. And so I mentioned that I'd played two, uh, two sessions, um, with, uh, two, the second series. Um, but you know, I live in a military town. So a lot of times you'll get the people that you try to have as your, your group. And then people get stationed elsewhere or they go out to sea. And it was just really hard for me to keep a group going. And so he invited me to his, um, his YouTube one. So he sent me the link and I checked it out while they were playing just to see, now, I don't know how people do it that way. Cause it's kind of, I think you get more when they're the energy of the people actually in the room with you. Right. But, uh, he was actually in his car for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's <laughs> in his car with the phone playing, nice. you know, so I'm going to roll a six and, uh, it was hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's great. He's a good guy to talk to. And he always does it like he's right under a street light. So you have that odd sort of noir. Uh, right. Lighting. Next to the ambiance. <laughs> it does. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if he picks those parking lots intentionally, but it's hilarious. I, I think so, he does. I think I think he does. I bet I bet he has some reserve, like the worst lighting to get that sort of <laughs> black and gray. See here. Sort of <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to ask him when we get him on. So if this Most is definitely. If this, do you think he's going to be recording that episode too in the car? <laughs> I would I would put money on it. I, I would definitely put money on it. So one of the things that uh, when we were prepping for this show because we're going to transition, we could talk some about your books um, that I was telling Chris about because we're exploring you know the series that we're writing together. And uh, one of the things that that I was telling about your series was that you you had this Peter Pan series, yeah. right? Where you sort of turn the um, the tables on it. I've bought the books; I haven't had a chance to read them, but you are on my list to read and review for my blog. Um, Sweet. But you, you turned it around. Where you know, what if Captain Hook was the the good guy? So, do you want to talk to us about your uh, your Peter Pan series, and we can? geek out about that for a little bit and uh i'm sure chris is gonna have lots of questions he intentionally did not look those up because he (laughs) wanted to be surprised Uh, we we try to have one person on each topic who didn't prepare so that way we can sort of free oh yeah um to give it a little less of a canned you know where it sounds like we're just robots (laughs) because we know nicole is the only cyborg among us that is true yeah and uh so uh second star um and actually, Captain Hook is the bad guy, but Peter Pan is also the bad guy. Uh, that 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 was the twist: is that Peter Pan is the bad guy. Um, and so, Second Star is kind of uh, kind of one of those odd projects. And I've I've said it in a couple interviews where I had it in my head where I wanted to do kind of kind of what uh, Hugh Howey and Michael Bunker did with their uh, beginning series. Um, Pennsylvania and then uh, wool for Hugh Howie. And they, what they basically did is wrote uh, small novellas uh, that were basically five chunks of a completed whole novel. And then at the end of that, put, put all those five chunks together in an omnibus and stole, sold a lot of, a lot of copies and made, made pretty good scratch out of it. And so that was my idea. Why don't I just do that? And I had this uh, idea about, um, uh, writing this Peter Pan story. And, and basically how that came about was I, I'm a huge military sci-fi uh, fanboy, right? So I've, I, I grew up on David Weber. Um, I'll read a lot of, uh, you know, Star Wars books or, or, you know, the, the aliens books that were really popular in the nineties. I read all hmm. of those, uh, the predator books and all that kind of stuff. I'm a huge fan of military sci-fi and that kind of thing. And, um, I, I haven't well, actually my first story that I actually, that I wrote ever, uh, that I still have is a, uh, a handwritten 
notebook that's uh, wide rule, not college, uh-huh. <laughs> that I that I wrote when I was 14, and it's a military science fiction book. Awesome. Um, any, any plans to revive that and uh, try to bring own. it? <laughs> you know, no. Uh, the funny thing about that that story, and that story was uh, called The Final Frontier because I was not uh, original at all, hmm. and, I, and I and I was a huge Star Trek, Star Trek fan. I still am a, a Next Generation fan, but uh, I wrote that book, and then I wrote a sequel called uh, Armada to that, and that was uh, uh, written all the way through uh, on uh, notebook paper with pen and, and pencil, and um, no no plans to redo those two stories. They're very simplistic. Um, uh, they're they're very um, they're they're not any good. <laughs> but you can I, turn them into I, children's I, books. Yeah, and. What I basically did with the the series is I, I I used the bones of the universe and have basically created um, a, a huge sandbox that I'm going to play in and and so to kind of bring it back to Second Star, I had this huge sandbox of military science fiction story, a, a big big epic that I wanted to write, and I didn't feel that I was ready. And so I sat down one day and I started brainstorming on these smaller projects and, and what I could do. And one of the ideas was, why don't you take a well-known children's book uh, and write, flip it around, make it in a science fiction setting. Uh, and then so I, I, I said, OK, so what can I do here? I started thinking about Peter Pan. Um, and then I was like, ooh, but what if Pan's the bad guy? That's great. And. And so I started coming up with this and, and the, the first book kind of went through three or four iterations before I got it down. Um, but the, the five novella thing didn't work. I, I, w- I was, it probably, probably should have done that as my first project because the, the first book's 25, 25,000 words. The second book is like 44,000 words. The third book is like 65,000 <laughs> words. And I'm sure, I, I'm sure the fourth book will be, Right at about sixty-five or seventy-five thousand words, um, but the fourth book will be the last one in the series. But so basically, what it is is uh, it's a, it's not military science fiction, but it is science fiction with a military guy as the main character, and uh, you have Wendy, Michael, and John. Uh, most all the characters that I created for the series, I used names from the actual book, and if you go back and read Peter Pan. Um, the actual book by James uh, Barr, uh, I've pulled a lot of the characters from his story and used them as mine. So um, like Wendy is the leader of the Lost Boys. You've got Michael. You've got John. Uh, you've got Tinkerbell, but her name is uh, Bella. And, uh, and she's like like a steampunk-ish teenager that loves tinkering with things, right? So yeah. you she, she makes all these cool gadgets and she's really eccentric and she's one of my favorite characters to write. Um, also in the, in the original novel, there was a set of twins. Um, so I created a set of twins called Tim and Tom. Uh, Tom is, uh, I don't, he, he's not a very nice person. <laughs> uh, Tim is really nice. Um, hmm. Pan is the bad guy. Hook is uh hook is the bad guy. And we don't see a lot of him uh, in the first in the first uh, three books, we see him a little bit. We see a cameo of him kind of in the, in the second book. Uh, and then we see a little bit of him in the th- third book. And the fourth book is where you'll see a lot of him. Um, and uh, in the, in the, uh, the thing I did uh, with it is I, I started it. And then in the first two books is basically a long running chase scene um, where John gets pulled into this world and that, the th- the theory is, or the uh, the idea is that uh, the Neverland is a planet, and the the planet's called Navaris, and then they just kind of turned it into calling it Neverland because there's uh, a ring, uh, kind of like Saturn's rings, that's around the planet, and there's a mineral or a uh, component, a compound in these rings and these rocks that basically prolong human life and um it's it's basically the fairy dust right um but also if you take and compound that dust and mix it uh like with any good thing there's going to be people that mess it up right so a lot of uh, there's uh people that take this uh dust 
and create a drug out of it. And it's, uh, it's basically this drug that puts you into a perpetual state of um, feeling really good. And people get stuck there and they, they get stuck and, and it basically it consumes everything about them. The, and the planet, um, these uh, aliens called the Graft came to this planet and somehow found Earth and wanted to bring humans to this planet to study them, right? So they set up this complex and this this uh, kind of, uh, it's not really a Stargate portal, but it's it's more of like a, a magic portal because there's, there's uh, not any rings or anything. It's just a beam that tears open space-time. They can go over there and and uh, basically they um, they abduct all these humans and they bring them back to the, the planet. And there's hundreds of thousands of humans now on this planet that have been living there for several years, uh, you know, 100 years or so, uh, 200 years or so. Time doesn't work right on the planet. It's different than it is on Earth. So it could be longer on this planet than it is just because I wanted to play with time that way. And uh, so basically what happened is that as the graph are experimenting and they're finding out that this dust is making uh, humans live longer, it's actually starting to kill them. Oh. So when this, when the story starts, the graph, the aliens have vanished, they have disappeared and they, you find out eventually that the dust was basically killing them off. Um, and they just left everything there. And so now there's a huge civil war into who's going to control everything. And uh, Hook comes to power, um, and you don't. In the first two books, you you see Pan as the bad guy, and you know that Wendy's mad at him, and all these things happen, and you don't know why he's the bad guy because in your mind he's like, no, no, Pan's the good guy. What's wrong? Well, in the third book, Shadows of Neverland, what I did was I I wrote a dual timeline story where in the present time they're going off to meet these uh, people to help them in their fight. And in the past timeline, we see what happened. We see the establishment of the Lost Boys. We see Wendy meeting Pan. We see Wendy meeting Michael and John and, and all these people. We see her her story through her point of view. And then we see what happened to Pan at the end that turned him back. Oh, nice. And 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 so then the, the fourth book will be kind of the, the culmination of all of that. Um the, we're going to tie up all the loose ends in the fourth book and and uh, find out who lives and who dies and who gets to live heavily af- happily ever after. Uh, hmm. it, it's um, it's a fun book to write. Um, I wish it was done already because <laughs> because I don't I don't really want to to spend the the two months it's going to take to write it because I've got all these other projects that I've got lined up. Uh, but I I'm aiming to see if I can get it done this year, 2018. Uh, probably by the end of the year, we'll see, depending on how these other projects run out. So <clears throat> what gave you the idea to take this this Peter Pan story that everyone is familiar with and to say, you know what, let's just set it in space. So instead of a pirate ship, you have a pirate spaceship. Right. So um, I, I'm i a huge – like everything that I think about and that I like and enjoy is – predominantly science fiction, right? So it's very hard for me to think of a story in modern day, in a modern day setting or in a non science fiction setting um, without wanting to put sci-fi elements in there. I, I want to be able to make up my own stuff. If they want to have a laser gun, I want them to have a laser gun or if, if they're going to, if they're going to have a jetpack, I want them to have a jetpack, right? So m- everything that I write, uh, I, I like to write in a science fiction setting. And so knowing when I, when I was thinking of the idea of writing a, a fairy tale and kind of turning it on its head, the first thing that popped into my mind was, Hey, well, let's just make it science fiction. Cause we do whatever we want. <laughs> right. If it's science fiction. So. <laughs> Outstanding. So uh, you mentioned that they had this, um, this rock that they basically pulverized to give them essentially fairy dust. <clears throat> so where did that, that's a unique uh, approach to blending you know, essentially science fantasy. Um, so where did that idea for, for that, for the fairy dust come from? Um, well, it would just kind of, it just kind of came to me as I'm trying to, I'm trying to take all these different elements from Peter Pan and, 
and figure out how to give them a sci-fi feel without giving them like this Peter Pan's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a fairy tale. It's a, it's a child's make believe. Um, there's not anything that explains anything. There's just this fairy dust is there because fairy dust is there. Right. And right. It is what it is. Yeah. You sprinkle it on yourself and think happy thoughts and you can fly. So now, was that, um, was that in the original or is that in the Disneyfication of it? Because you've obviously studied this a little bit more in depth for this story. Uh, it is in the original, not not to the extent that they that they they played it in uh, in the Disney movies, but it is it is in there a little bit in, in the in the original book. See, this fascinated me because as a kid, <clears throat> I remember when uh, Peter Pan the TV cartoon came on in the mornings, and we could watch it right before the school bus, before we had to book it down the street to catch the bus. And I remember my sister, my little sister, and I used to have the most epic fights over whether we were watching GI Joe or Peter Pan. <laughs> so, so, you know, this this to me was like has that little bit of a nostalgia feel to it. This, uh, yeah. this whole concept, which I just think is actually pretty, pretty epic. Co- co- coincidentally, the Peter Pan the Disney cartoon I hated as a kid because when I was when I was eight or nine, I lived in Germany and we always had these friends come over and they had like a little four or five six year old little girl and her favorite movie was Peter Pan. Well, we always had to watch what she wanted to watch to come over. So every time they came over, it was Peter Pan. I so is that back in the day, you only have one TV. You didn't have every TV in every room. Right. Right. So every time they came over, it was Peter Pan. I was so sick of it. And it made it, it that much funnier when I was like, Oh, I want to write a book about Peter Pan. That sounds like fun. <laughs> Did your parents get a kick out of that? Uh, no, I, they didn't really put it together. Right. Um, you know, but cause it was one of those things where it's just like, Oh, stop. You know, we just let her watch what she wants to watch. And it wasn't a, a, as big of a deal to them as it was to me. Um, but, you know, like getting back to your question, you, you take you take different aspects of the story and you put a twist on it. So you get the dust, you get it from pulverizing rocks. Then, and that is that explains the 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 long the the long living humans. Um Tinkerbell or, or Bella, she devised a way to manipulate gravity because that was uh, manipulating gravity was uh, one of the main uh, technologies of the aliens that disappeared. So she's she tinkers with a lot of their things, and she creates this anti grav uh, uh, harness, and this allows them to fly. So, and this this anti grav harness <clears throat> when it when it powers on these power power bands kind of pulse and flicker around your body. And that creates a green type of energy around you and it trails around you. And so that kind of gives it the little, you know, he's not really trailing fairy dust, but he's trailing green energy as he's flying around. And um, so that kind of gives that, that touches the Peter Pan can fly deal. What about, and uh, what about with Bella? Is she, is she a little person? No, she's a, I mean, she's a girl. She's, she's a teenager. Um, I made her very, like I said, she's one of my favorite characters to write in the series because she is very one of these um, uppity, uh, really spunky type. I'm just going to say what I'm going to say. I'm, I want to do what I want to do. And she doesn't, she doesn't have a whole like, um, uh, responsibility of 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 doing anything like the other like the other people Ah. and so she she's just a very fun loving uh she's ridiculously smart um and she makes all these deals uh but she she's very happy-go-lucky very um fun loving not super serious at all um and her and tim and tom are actually all three their siblings so tim and tom are the tim and tom are the older um, they're, they're probably in their, their early twenties or late teens ish. And she's, she's around probably 15, uh, 16 and they're all, they're, they're, they're all three siblings and they lost their, their parents in one of the wars that happened before obviously the story starts. Now, was but, it the wars on Navarra or was it the wars on earth where before they were grabbed? Nope. The, the wars on, uh, Navaris, uh, they were actually born there. Um, Wendy was not born there. She was dragged, uh, through, um, with her sister, uh, Mags and her, uh, parents, her dad, uh, no, that's a twist. I don't want to give. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually the, the, one of the things that I, I tweaked, uh, I kind of, I wish I hadn't have done it now, but, um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, the her sister Mags is, is Maggie, and Maggie is like the 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 grandparent, right? That tells the story right. to, um, and so she actually makes it back to Earth. Oh. Um, and that that part is explored in book three too, um, and and actually the town where the the city the the main the main city here in in Navaris is called Bar Town, um, which is a, a nod to James Barr, the author. Nice. Um, so I like those subtle nods. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know I've got a I got a deal in there about think happy thoughts too, and you know all these little cool little things uh, like uh, the. Um, one of the officers on on Hook's crew in the book is named Starkey, so I've got a Starkey in there. Uh, Smee, you never actually ever see Smee, but he's the mayor of Bartown, um, and he, he he gets mentioned a couple hmm, times. Mr. Smee, um, so, yeah, <laughs> like so, that. It's good. Yeah, they're they're fun books. Uh, they're not they're not super popular. Uh, people that have read them uh, like them. The only the only uh, real criticism i get is uh that the first one is way too short which i completely agree with um once once four is done i'm gonna put them all together and uh kind of go with my original plan and then sell that as a bundle and hopefully people will appreciate that so you any plans on doing an audio omnibus sort of publishers pack if you would yeah once it's completely finished and done then i'm gonna do that um uh when that is i have no idea Okay. Definitely understand. So we uh, we ran a little bit long on that segment, but it was so fascinating. So if we uh, could take a momentary pause, and now a word from our sponsors. The Terran Empire is dead. Long live the Empire. Commander Jared Mertz, the bastard son of the Emperor, and his half-sister, Princess Kelsey, barely speak to one another. To their dismay, their father seizes an opportunity to change that and sends them on a dangerous quest to explore the fallen Empire. Separated from home by an impassable gulf and struggling to redefine their relationship, they find themselves thrust into a vicious war. Unless they work together to stop the Empire's deadly legacy, billions face a horrific fate. Empire of Bones, written by Terry Mixon, now available at Amazon.com. All right. Thanks for being patient. So when we left, we were talking about your uh, your Peter Pan series, which I think is fascinating. And I'm actually kind of excited to read it. Um, but you also have uh, another series that you recently announced and you just published book one of your Terra Nova series. Now, is that the name of the series or just book one? Uh, both. It's the name of the first book. The first book is called Terra Nova and the, the series is called the Terra Nova Chronicles. Okay. God. So, so you want to tell us like the origin story of, of that, that universe, how that came to be? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Terra Nova is, uh, based in Richard Fox's, I call it the Emberverse. Um, uh, it, Richard Fox is a sci-fi author. He writes the, uh, Ember War series, uh, Iron Dragoons, uh, the Lost Fleet series. And, um, we had Richard on our show. Uh, he was, I think one of the he was like one of the, the t- first six guests, six or seven guests. I can't remember which. Um, I found his book on audio. Luke Daniels narrated it. And uh, after listening to the first one, uh, I plowed through the rest of them. And <laughs> uh, I absolutely loved his series. It was a- absolutely what I was looking for uh, when I wanted to read some military science fiction. Because you get some that is pinned military science fiction in Amazon, and it's absolutely not. Are you talking um, about the Manchester books where they're really just romance novels? Well, no, but you know, you get there, me being in the military, you being in the military, I, I've got a certain idea of what military science fiction is in my head uh, and what I want out of a space Marine book or out of a, a, a starship battle book. Right. Sure. Um, 
uh, you look at uh, Nick Cole's uh, and Jason Onsbach's Galaxy's Edge. Legion Air is a phenomenal example of that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's like sort of like Afghanistan you have other- in space with with stormtroopers, not stormtroopers. Right, exactly. Um, so you read a lot of books that you know that I I try to get through, and I want to find some what specifically I'm looking for, and I I wasn't finding that until I got to the Ember War. Um, I got to the Ember War, read all the way through it. We had him on the show. We became friends. Um, he's been on the show several times and we talk almost all the time on, on Facebook and email. Uh, we talk on the phone all the time. And so, uh, last year, uh, January of 2017, probably, probably really close to almost exactly a year from today ago. Um, he, we were talking about, uh, being successful in writing. We're talking about doing different things. And he said, so, uh, Hey, if I was going to do, some more spinoff series of my Ember War stuff. Would you be interested in, in maybe riding with me? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> twist my arm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So I said, absolutely. I would. And, um, the conversation kind of went from there and, you know, he was like, what, what would you want to write in? And, 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 uh, what kind of story would you like to tell? And these are the ideas that I have for spinoffs. And, uh, he gave me the, uh, his pitch for Terra Nova was basically um, uh, everything that uh, Andromeda, uh, Mass Effect Andromeda did poorly. I want to do well with Terra Nova, and uh, I was like, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm so I'm right there, man. I'm I'm right there." And so uh, we started working together on the on the the planning of the book. Uh, took us a little long to kind of hit our stride. Uh, he was super busy with Iron Dragoons and the Exiled Fleet, and um, it took us a, a while to kind of figure out how we were going to do this collaboration because um, uh, I'm, I'm part of another collaboration that I can't speak about yet. Um, basically, their collaboration was, here's the World Bible, you write a book, and then when it's done, give it to us. We'll we'll proof it to make sure that it fits in our world, and then we'll go from there. So I actually um, know the secret, and I'm gonna I'm gonna spill it. You heard it here first. So if anybody's actually watched Jumanji, we actually got there. That company made a Ouija board, and we've been talking to Heinlein, and it's super secret. But I'm just saying, Starship <laughs> Troopers, <laughs> Starship Troopers. I'm not, not saying that's, right. that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Right. No, I, no. I find it funny that you found Richard through the Ember Wars through the uh, through the audiobook because that's how I found him as well. So when my first book came out, um, I, I had the advantage most first time authors don't as I was writing in someone else's established universe. So I sort of had his yeah. his fan base, which is largely British, I think, but um, Tim Taylor's books. And so when Podium approached us about the rights to the audiobooks. They wanted to um, to prove that you know they could work with military sci-fi, and they'd publish other veteran authors. And so, as part of the um, back and forth of that business deal, they actually sent me a copy of the um, Ember Wars Publishers Pack, and it was like crack. Because the minute I started listening, I'm like, oh, I've got a. I bought all of the rest of them that day, and my wife got the bill for all those audiobooks because I didn't know about Audible subscription mm-hmm. yet. And she got that bill, and she's like, "What were you smoking? You didn't ask." <laughs> so I'm still working my way through those because uh, I've reviewed the first two, uh, and then just you know life got crazy. And um, but yeah, I, I find it funny that other people found him through his audio books as well. So I'd, I'd say that's a uh, a wise investment for him. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. So you have um, you have this this book set in the Ember Wars universe, but right. is it now? And, and I've read that, so I know it starts off on Earth, and yep. you know this alien construct sends. Um, and and I, I've posted written reviews on book one and two, so we'll link those in the show notes uh, from my blog. Um, let me make a note of that, and then um, so it's and it, then you know. Fast forward, the adventure starts. So is your series set on Earth as well, post-invasion uh, by the Zaros? Well, so it's it's um, it starts there. And basically, what Terra Nova is, is you get to about, I think it's book five or six in the main Ember War series. Um, it, it 
maybe it's uh, as far as uh, seven. I'm not sure. But Jer- uh, Ken Hale is the main character of uh, The Ember War. And uh, you, you follow his story. Uh, Ken has a and Ken's parents were killed in the original Lazaro's invasion in book one of the the Ember War. So uh, Ken has a brother. His name is Jared, and Jared is also in the military. And about five uh, five or six uh, books in, the Koresh, uh, which is another alien race, so they're very ancient. They basically give humanity a a uh, out uh for the zaros uh war because they think they're going to lose and they say this this galaxy that we've given you these coordinates to there's a planet here it's very earth-like um there's no one out there there's no aliens it's completely fresh um there's nothing to worry about you can go out there and start another colony and basically save humanity from extinction and Jared Hale, Ken's brother, leads a, a colony fleet out there. The, the catch is that it's so far away that it the gravity tides that affect the crucible gates, which are kind of like stargates, they only correctly line up in the math like every few decades. So you can have 20 or 30 or 40 or 60 years that go by and you're not going to be able to connect because, just because of the distances involved. And so when it's basically a one-way trip, jail Jared and the and the, the colony go out there, and they're 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 gone. They're they're by. They're you can't. You, there's no communication between the two. So come to Terra Nova, the the novel. This is um, I want to say it's it's uh, fifteen ish, twenty years ish after the. Uh, last book in the interwar series it's after the zaros war um we've beaten the zaros and uh now we're continuing on and doing other things and we're sending a second fleet to terra nova and ken hale is in charge of the second fleet he wants to reunite with his brother um ken is now married to uh marie duran who was a uh, a fighter pilot in the ember war series and they have two I children like that character. Elias and the, the fighter pilot yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, they they have two sons now, Elias and Jerry, um, and uh, that's a nod to Elias, who's a, an Iron Heart in the main series, and Jerry. They obviously named their kid after his brother. So they get to Terra Nova, and there are no humans there. the The colony is abandoned; it's empty. Um, they uh, they go down to uh, see what's wrong with the colony and are attacked by these, uh, they're like biomechanical, um, skeleton ish type warriors that are everywhere. They come Mm. out of the woodworks and they get attacked. And so the, the story of Terra Nova, the first book is what happened to the colonists why are all these uh, alien kind of uh, big bad aliens here? And why are there people here in the first place? Because the Koresh said that this was an empty galaxy. They said this is an empty place. Why Why is there now aliens here? Um, so that is the that is the mystery. That is the, the, the story of the first book. What happened to the human colonists and what um, the main character – Kit Carson, who's a, a pathfinder, what her and what she and her team do to find the human colonists and what they do to, to rescue them. Interesting. Uh, there's another so, book on my list of two reads. Uh, <laughs> maybe that it's a, it's, it's a really good book and, and we've got some really good uh, reviews on it on Amazon. Uh, some really good feedback. Um, it did really well in its first month. Um, and, um, it, you know, when Richard came to the, this book and we started talking about it, uh, we knew that we wanted to tie characters back to the original series. So Ken Hale is in it. Marie Duran is still in it. Um, there's a couple other mis- uh, mystery characters that'll pop up uh, later in book one, and then they'll kind of have a uh, a touch in book two. Um, and... Uh, it, a lot of people are saying they really like these characters. And that was one of the things that I asked Richard about when we started is 
I said, I don't want to have to try to write your characters because I've read the whole series, but I don't, I don't know these characters as well as you do. Were you worried that you're going and, to spoil them? Uh, not spoil them. Yes, but, but not write them correctly. Okay. Not, not, you know, Ken Hale is Ken Hale and Richard li- lives and breathes Ken Hale. Right. Right. So I, I would feel awkward coming in and trying to write Ken Hale and then messing it up for the readers. Uh, I don't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that. So we decided to create brand new characters that were main characters for the series um, that I could create from scratch and that I would know that way it would be a lot easier for me to write the, I'm a huge character guy. I love character. Mm -hmm. And so creating these new characters and, 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 uh, watching them kind of grow through the series has been really fun. So I had, um, when I wrote my, my book in Tim's world, I had that problem too. So I definitely sympathetic. So I had, I thought I was grabbing minor characters, like, you know, someone who might have had a three sentence little write up about him. Like he was here on this day kind of thing. And so I definitely feel you because when you're writing these characters, even the minor ones, some authors, it's like, no, 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 no. This guy has an entire life story. You just don't know it yet. So when you do that, it's like, you know, they're like, well, no, no, Bob wouldn't do that. Well, Bob really only said hello on page 12. What do you mean Bob wouldn't do that? <laughs> but but some, some authors, and, and I don't know Richard's writing style, but I, I could definitely see where that would be um, difficult if, if the author is overly attached. So Right. Well, and, and like I said uh, earlier, uh, his – his uh, collaborating with him is a little different than just doing an open world collaboration. He knows, he knows the characters, he knows the overarching story he wants to tell. And so a lot of our, a lot of the story we have closely plotted together and he is very involved in what happens in the books. Um, Not so much in book two. I've gotten, I'll give you a little example. So when I got book one, I got a a 15,000 word outline. Wow. And, and basically wrote the story from that. Um, book two, I got a 5,000 word outline and, and so you can kind of see how we're working with each other there. Um, book two, as of right now is sitting at a project total of 51,640 words. Um, and I should have it done in a week and a half. Awesome. And so uh, book book two will be out in uh, February-ish. Uh, it's called Bloodlines. Uh, we've actually already got um, Audible or a, an audio book deal. Is it with Podium um, as well? They're a good company. Yes. And um, they are going to do a uh, basically a publisher's pack with book one and book two. Um, I don't know who's going to narrate it. Um, we haven't got the, the, uh, the set in stone answer yet. I do have a couple Luke ideas. Daniels? I don't want to mention, I, I I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to kind of ruin it, but, uh, I, I, we, we have a couple of, uh, interested parties. And so hopefully, hopefully it all, uh, I had, great. um, Jeffrey Kafer from podium do mine. And I, it was, it's kind of awkward when we're listening to, cause if anybody doesn't know when you get, so first off a publisher's pack, cause you try to define terms for people that aren't in the business is if, uh, if some books, the trend is now to shorter books as the attention spans. So instead of the 120,000 word book, you might get two books that are 60 K each, but for audiobook, it's all about the size, the length. If people are going to spend the money and the narrator is going to get paid, they want, you know, 14 hours or, or I think, was it Brandon Sanderson's book you were listening to was like 150 billion hours. Or something. And, um, Oathbringer is fifty six so, hours. So long. obviously, wow. if, if people can get that book for one audio credit, and then your book is only four hours, obviously that's that's not a it's a no brainer for the reader. Right. And so, a publisher's pack is generally right. when they will combine book one and two in a series to get you interested, and they do that you know by just combining the books, and that's that's what they did with Richard Fox's Ember Wars as well. But uh, it was kind of awkward because when they send you when they do an audio book, the the narrator or the company in this case will send you a sample of the, of the work or even the finished product. If you wanted to, to go line by line and make sure everything's good. And are you okay with the pronunciations? Um, I know Josh and I have talked, he's, he's like me. He's just happy. Someone's reading it out loud. He doesn't care how they pronounce it. If they want to say Jim right. instead of Bob, I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Maybe it was Jim. Um, but so, but so my- well, it's funny when, when, uh, when Richard, 
uh, there's a when we had Luke Daniels on, Richard uh, Luke Daniels read all Sturgeon. of Richard's books, right? Is it Sturgis and, is that the name? How you pronounce that? Uh, n- um. <laughs> I know who you're talking about, but no, that's not it. It uh, so his second book is called uh, Ru- uh, "Ruins of Anthelus." Loved it. Um, well, Richard pronounces it um, Anthelus, and uh, Luke pronounces it Anthalus. And so, oh. like, spoilers, <laughs> right? So there's a little little differences in there um, that were were kind of neat. Um, but yeah, I, I, if I listen to it and he pronounces a uh, an alien's name incorrectly, I, I don't care. Like it's whatever, right? Because I, uh, I'll, I'll pronounce something that I know that somebody else has read in my head incorrectly, and whatever. Hmm. So I, the funny thing is, is when when uh, because I was a new author, they gave me Jeffrey Kafer because he's an established and he's pretty good. I, I I was really impressed with his work, but he's an established audiobook narrator. But he also um, narrates the uh, the romance type stuff that my wife likes to listen to. Yeah. So she had she was having yeah. like totally crushing out on him. I'm like, I don't know if I should feel a little jealous <laughs> about this. Like, <laughs> should I shoo her out of the room when I'm listening to the audiobook sample? So I think um, you know, all jokes aside, you can. The narrator can definitely turn a, a good story into an awesome one just with with what they bring to the table with right. the dramatic reading. Um, and I think I really do think who you get to narrate matters. Um, oh, absolutely, so, absolutely. And so that's does. the fun th- part. It's like one of the things that after my experience dealing with Podium, and you could talk about how this changed your writing when you're done, because I don't think you've had any audiobooks yet, have you? Uh, the I I do have two short stories that. Uh, one of them was included in the explorations um, through the wormhole okay. anthology, which uh, Keith Michelson uh, read that. Um, and then I have another short story uh, it, that came out in um, uh, explorations uh, war. Okay. Uh, or first con no explorations, first contact and Keith Michelson did a reading for that one. It's not, out anywhere because I haven't had the time to put it up anywhere. I'm probably going to put it on my website. I'm probably not going to sell it. Um, but I, those are the only two things that I've so, actually had produced. So one thing is an author and as somebody who just reads a lot of the written word is you realize certain things like said, Bob said, like that becomes sort of your eye glosses over it, right? And and certain right. things that, that might look okay and sound okay in your head and on paper when someone else is reading it out loud, suddenly it's like, ooh, that sounds awkward. So ooh. it definitely does change how you write. But if you can accept that the audio presentation, sort of like the um, the old radio dramas, if you can accept that that is different than just the book and it becomes its own entity, just like the difference between a movie and and the book, uh, it definitely brings some color to a world because now you've got accents right. and, and there's there are people now instead of just characters on the page. So it's definitely it's definitely interesting, and I'm excited to to hear what comes out of this Terra Nova. Cause I've skimmed it uh, before I bought it. I, I buy the, um, um, the 10% sample. And if I like it, I buy it. And so I, I checked it out and I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be interested to see how, how podium or whoever, um, how they handle that. It's definitely going to be fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to, to see how it comes out. I, 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 I'm a huge audiobook junkie, so like when when the Explorations anthology came out on Audible, I, I immediately picked it up and then fast forwarded to my <laughs> story so I could listen to it. Uh, and and I'd already listened to it because he sent me the he sent me the pre the the samples right so I could uh, so I could proof it. Uh, but listening it listening to it as a proof file uh, and then listening to it as an audio like a finished mastered a uh, file that's on my audible app right. that I can listen, that I can listen to in my car. And I'm hmm. like, Hey, I wrote that. That's cool. Uh, that was uh that was really a, a phenomenal experience. And I'm, I'm, ex- I'm really excited to see, uh, to listen to Terra Nova. Outstanding. Now you, you did say you, you did sign it with, um, um, with podium or is that still in the works? It, well, yes, it is. We like I said, we don't have any specifics on what it is on on who's doing it, uh, narrator wise. But yes, we do. We do have it already set up to go. Outstanding. Wonderful. So when you have um, more news on that, you definitely need to uh, to come back and tell us about it. 
Um, cause that's going to be interesting. Now, one of the things that this is purely selfish on, on Chris and I's part is because we both have, you know, interesting lives to get in the way of our writing. So we thought, well, one, it could be fun and two, it could help us, you know, produce quicker. So we decided to co-write together, which we've mentioned. But, uh, so why don't you, uh, tell us how that works a little bit more specifically on the details of what's your process with Richard? Do you pass it back and forth? Like how, how do you handle two people writing one book? So, uh, like I said, the first, the first and second book, the processes uh, are, are are pretty close to the same, um, with some tweaks. The first book he gave me a fifteen thousand word outline with basically every plot point uh, and every scene already f- uh, kind of envisioned, um, with some dialogue here and there, and and you know, uh, we knew exactly where we were going with the book, uh, and then I sat down. And I wrote, a, uh, I think I, I ended up writing about 55,000 words. Um, and then he got it and added some different things, changed some things. Uh, and we got it to, I, I, I want to say we're at like 64, 65. I can't remember the exact title, the exact number of words. Um, so basically, I'll write everything and then he'll read it. Uh, he'll mm-hmm. make basically developmental edits. Uh, he'll he'll make uh, some scene corrections. There was um, there was a part in uh, point in time where we were, I think, where we we were a week out from from publishing, and that's one of the big different one of the big things I had to deal with uh, in a project. Is I like to have I'm I'm really nervous when it comes to publishing, so I like to have everything done and have it done for like a week or so before I'm hit the publish button. And Richard's not like that at all. Um, basically he can finish a book and <laughs> publish like the next hour. <laughs> and so, wow. so we were, we were in, we were in the final week and we had already set the deadline. We had already set the publishing date. And so we were a week out from that. And Richard sends me a message and he said, Hey, we need this scene that does this. And I need it like four or six thousand words long and i need it in like two days Hmm. and wow the no pressure and i right and uh and i said well i don't i don't have any characters there i don't know what's going on i i have to envision this whole new scene like i i basically had to create a section of the story from scratch that had never been touched before that had never been even thought of before and i had to do i had to uh, come up with that plot it draw it out storyboard it and write it in two days and i did uh and i got it to him and then in the final product he cut like four thousand words out of that scene and we had like a two thousand word <laughs> scene that we uh so it's a little it's it, it, it it's a little different it's not it's not, it's a collaboration, uh, more like the second book collaboration is that we've spent a couple hours on the phone discussing where we want the story to go, what we want the characters to do, um, what the arcs are for the, the different segments of the book. Um, and then he wrote the 5,000 word outline and then I have extrapolated 52,000 words out of that 5,000 word outline. Um, and uh, I, I would imagine that my my draft is probably going to be around 65. Uh, and then when he gets it, it'll probably bump to, to 70. Probably usually he generally adds a whole bunch of things in it that I don't either don't see or don't realize that I don't. See. OK. Um, so, um, like I said, that should be done uh end of next week probably my my deadline is uh my deadline is january 20th but i think i i should be able to have it done by the 15th um and then uh and that 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 draft will be sent to him uh and then he'll go through it uh do a developmental put it all together um send it to we we use uh two editors and a proofreader so he'll send it off to them, get it edited, get it proofed. So is it one then, after the other, or is it two editors simultaneously? Uh, it's it's one after the other. We'll send it. And generally, what he does is what he did on the last one is we were still finishing the last half of the book, and he'll send the first half out. Um, and then when the second half is done, and when they send the first half back, he'll send the second half 
uh, but to the editor. Um, and then when the whole thing is done from the first one, he'll send the whole thing to our second editor uh, for basically a second copy. And then we'll send it to another proofreader. And then, uh, and then it goes to market and we, we, we don't, he typically doesn't do pre-orders. Um, we're considering it this time around. We're not sure if we're going to do it yet. Uh, but you should be able to see it at the very latest of uh, the back half of February. I would assume it's going to be closer to the mid-February, beginning of February. So Outstanding. So in our show notes, uh, we have listed um, Josh's Amazon page. And so um, if you're listening to this later, uh, you'll be able to click on his Amazon page and you'll find that uh, that story there because um, it'll have everything he's written. So um, well, there is that. Now, are there any other besides the uh, the Jumanji-esque Ouija board with Heinle? <laughs> um, which I'm telling you, it's going to be great. Everybody says so. Um, and yeah. Even Heinlein. Um, <laughs> But you know, right. we, oh, yeah. we were just talking to him because you know I'm writing that same that same super secret project with Heinlein, and, and we were just talking about Josh, and we're like, he is the best <laughs> author ever. Everyone says so. He is going to be the next big thing. But um, <laughs> but other than other than that super secret project, which we'd love to have you back when you when you could talk about you know when Heinlein when Heinlein Absolutely. wink wink when he gives you the nod. I mean, we want, we want to talk right. about that. But are there any other books Absolutely. besides that and the collab? Or excuse me, the um, second star series, the Peter Pan that you're going to finish that you're working on. So 2018 is going to is super busy. Um, I've got um, once book two is done, which is called Bloodlines. Uh, the second Terra Nova book is called Bloodlines. I will I will take a break between book two and book three and finish my super secret project. Uh, I'll be, I should be able to finish that in about four weeks, get that sent off and then start writing on book three. And my, my goal is to do three, four and five right in a row for Terra Nova. It's a five book series planned right now. Um, whether or not I continue to write in that series, um, it's open for discussion. Uh, we haven't, uh, we haven't decided, uh, we, we know for sure that we're going to do five books in the original, in the first series, Terra Nova is going to be five books. Um, whether or not I pick up and do something else or we extend it, um, that's open for discussion. So, but right now the plan is I'll do the super secret book, uh, then do three, four and five in Terra Nova. Uh, after I do three, four and five, I am going to finish, uh, my first, uh, military science fiction novel, which is called Ed of edge of valor. I've heard you talk about that one. Uh, and, uh, edge of valor is, um, it's kind of a passion project of mine. It's, it's, I've been working on it in, in some form and, and edge of valor is actually set in the universe that I, I first talked about with those first two, uh, oh, nice. novels. Um, and it, it, it brings some of the characters that I had in those novels. It brings them into kind of a modern, uh, uh, envisioning of my writing universe. Now, um, the universe that edge of valor is set in, I, I plan on writing several different series in that universe where I'm going to have a military science fiction series. I want to have a firefly esque series. Uh, I even, it's funny that you mentioned children's books because I even have a YA science fiction series that I'm going to set in this universe. Um, and it's, it's kind of, uh, the, 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 um, I don't have a name for the universe as of yet. I probably should. Um, but everything that I have in my head to write, uh, science fiction wise, I am going to put in this universe. So they're all going to, you won't have to read them in order. Um, now the individual series you will. Um, but if you go from like my military sci-fi to my firefly series, there's no order there. Um, there is a timeline, but you don't have to read them in order. Um, and in the YA series, there's no timeline anyway. They're just going to, it's just going to fit here and there. Um, so edge of valor is, uh, basically a, it's a cross between, I don't know if you've ever seen black Hawk down. Yeah, I have. Uh, and have you ever seen courage under fire with Denzel Washington? I've, I've seen both of those mm -hmm. good movies. Okay. So edge of valor is basically courage under fire mixed with black Hawk down set in a military science fiction realm. And the book will, it uh, follows an investigator um, who is tasked with uh, figuring out why a mission 
on this alien world failed and went bad and a whole bunch of people died. And a, um, the military unit that went in to rescue this ambassador uh, of all of them that, that go in there, only three survive. And so he is got to figure out what happened. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes on with it. But basically those people lie to him. And when he's doing these interviews, uh, the, the majority of the book is written in third person limited form. And that is from the, the perspective of different characters. Um, but when he goes to interview the survivors, we switch to a first person limited, um, unreliable. Mm -hmm. And those people, those people are lying to him, but in the narrative, you don't know what they're lying about. Because it's them telling him their version of the story. From their point of view. From their point of view. I like it. And so what he has to do is figure out, you know, and some other things happen that kind of key him into this isn't right. Something's wrong here. Why are they, why are their stories not matching up? There's something different here. Um, it leads into a deeper conspiracy. Um, and the, the overarching, con um, series arc that I have for the military science fiction is, is just, you just get a little taste of it in this book. Um, and it's kind of wrapped into this conspiracy and what happens. Um, and, uh, and that will lead us into my plan is to have edge of valor and echoes of valor, which is the sequel, um, as a duology, which kind of introduces people into this big universe that I have planned. And then, the I have a trilogy planned that will be the huge, big, sweeping um, the David Weber esque military space opera, right? So, uh, Edge of Valor should be done by the summertime, at the latest, the fall time, depending on how long it takes me to do these other books. Um, I'm I, I hope that people like it. Uh, I everybody that I talk to about it or get really excited about it, um, but we'll we'll see. So here's here's two things that struck me when you were talking about that. Is one, uh, Black Hawk Down. For those that don't know, like the chaos that they show of combat, that is a very good representation of what it's like. Especially that scene where the, uh, or maybe I'm thinking, yeah, Black Hawk Down, where they have the the ringing sound and the guy can't hear, and right. you hear the like that. That's legit. Like that that jives with with what I experienced when I was overseas. So if you're interested in military movies books whatever I, I definitely recommend you read the book and watch the movie yeah that's, that's that's one it's it's definitely it's worth your time and it 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 doesn't uh, beat around the bushes and, and paint a rose-colored fairy tale right so the other part that you mentioned is where they're they're lying to him which is sort of shades of uh courage under fire and i'm curious about that because i you know i was a history major in my undergrad and and when i was at villanova i was working on a on a history master's degree in colonial American history. And my first, you know, love of history, I remember I was in the 10th grade and the, the teacher uh, was late and everyone that no, was in 11th grade, excuse me. And everyone that was in this class had had the year before it was an AP class where the professor, like literally the psych professor went insane. So they hospitalized her, which is kind of <laughs> wow. ironic. But so, and we had already paid $150 to take this AP exam to get college credit. So when the teacher was late on the first day, of course, we're all like, Panicking, like, no, 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 we're not doing this again. It was too crazy, you know, making up that lost month last year. No, 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 the teacher is going to be here, dang it. And then suddenly the teacher runs in, screaming like a crazy man. He's jumping on his desk, swinging from the overhead projector. And then suddenly he just stops. He sits down at his desk and he's right what you saw. As, this was a, a thought exercise. And so we all write what we saw and we all get up and we have to read what we saw to the class. And you realize that just, you know, when you started paying attention, where yeah. you were in the room, all of that affected what your memory of the event is. And the reason that's important is because if you study history, you know, first person account is the, is the, the Holy grail, but you have to understand humans are failable. Right. Fallible. Exactly. So is it, are they lying or is their memory just wrong? Or are, is their memory lying to them to make themselves feel better about, you know, I wasn't a coward. I couldn't have done anything because you know, whatever. Right. So is so, it one of those deals where they're lying? So like, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge character buff, right? So I, I do, I do character studies, everything that I read, I study character. And, uh, in my daily life, I study character and I study how people react to things. So some of it is that they're lying. Some of it is that that is how they interpret what happened. And some of it is telling the story to make themselves sound better. 
So, uh, you know, right. just embellishing it. You, right. Exactly. You have some people that can't just tell you a straight story. They're going to embellish it and say, oh, no, we ran 500 miles when really they the only fish ran. was this big. Yeah. yeah. No, exactly. So so a lot of that. So so you get a mix of embellishment. You get a mix of a mix of lies and you get a mix of truth, but truth from their perspective. And um, which I think is a very real thing. Now there's, there's a real, I, I don't like uh, twisting. Um, I didn't want to create a situation where I'm purposely hiding information from the reader and from the character, because I think you get a lot of, you get a lot of books, mystery books or, or whatever. Uh, for instance, the new star Wars movie hack, which, uh, um, which, which in, in which characters are purposely not telling the main character what's going on for no other reason than that the author or the writer didn't want the reader to know so that when the reveal comes later, the reader's like, oh, my God. But the whole time, the character should have known that. Right. So I wanted to make sure that there was a concrete, real reason why these people are not telling him the, the truth. And um, when you get into the book you start to see these things and this thing happens, this, this critical event that happens and that this critical event that it is, is, uh, uh, very dynamic. And it, it, it also speaks to, uh, the, um, legitimacy of orders in the military mm-hmm. and the, the, the hierarchy of whose orders are we following? Um, if we're going to follow this person's orders over this person's orders and why, and if we follow this person's orders, then what do we t- what do we say about the rest of the stuff? So it, it's really hard to not spoil it when I'm talking about the book, but there is, there is uh, some aspects and some things that happen during that mission and that lead to its failure that also lead to the people that survive having to not tell the truth about it. And so, uh, when when the things start to reveal themselves and and the the investigator starts to pin things together, um, it, it's a really it's it's both revealing for the character and for the reader, and both entities get the twist at the same wow. time, and both of them can the, both of them can have the holy crap moment of something else is going on here, and this is what it is. Interesting. So you have, um, well, we're you know running long, but we just decided. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm a talker. I apologize. <laughs> Both of us are too, although you wouldn't know it the way Chris is just grunting over there. <laughs> yeah, he'll come into his own. I, I promise. He's he's a talker once you get him. I'm going. just I, yeah. I'm just so, stunned. I can I can see this book in my head. I love these ca- types of movies. I'm going to buy this book. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. See, I actually had a different reason why Chris was grunting. I thought because you know we've mentioned he's a mar- was a marine. I thought maybe he was eating his crayons. So you know, <laughs> I had mouths full of crayons. <laughs> I just thought maybe you know we were listening to him eat his supper. But yeah, so, <laughs> you uh, on um on the well, maybe when I get the the book done, I, you guys can beta read it for me. Outstanding. Oh, that'd be great. So you've mentioned on KSM that when you first started, that your mother helped you some with with your with your early writing with the editing. So does your family? Uh, still involved in the back end or do you now um, handle things yourself? I know some authors, it, they say it creates uh, drama when their spouse is the one going behind them. Actually, uh, no, I, I don't, I can't, I think that was Scott that mentioned that, that his mom, oh, it, Scott, okay. Scott and it, Scott and it, Scott's mom is a writer also. So they kind of uh, go back and forth. Okay. So uh, I'm mixing it up. It. Yeah, but that's okay. They do that all the time, but, uh, but no, actually hear, Scott is bald. So that, that is true. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, but actually, none of them, I think I'm not sure if my family's written the read the books or not. Uh, I know that uh, I think my dad has picked up a couple of them. He's never talked to me about it. He's a reader. Uh, my mom's a reader, but she's more into the romance side. My wife is not a reader at all. She's never read any of my books. Uh, she indulges me when I talk to her about the, that, and it's more of the uh, yes, honey, you're it's very smart and you're very good. And yeah, same here. <laughs> well, yeah, well so. te- technically, she reads. She just reads work uh, books. Right. You, and, you don't and, get into her profession without being right. And and she she she's not a huge she she. She first of all, she hates anything science fiction, Star Wars, Star Trek. All, as soon as it comes on the screen, she's like, "Nope, turn it off. I'm not looking at that stuff." Um, it heresy, she, I say. 
oddly mm. enough, she loves Harry Potter, uh, which I got her into. She will watch Harry Potter anytime it's on. T- if she could watch Harry Potter 24 hours a day, she would watch Harry Potter 24 hours a day. The <laughs> other and uh, same same thing goes for a uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, it took me six. No, it took me seven seasons to get her to watch Game of Thrones with me. And then when she finally watched it with me, we uh, she watched some of the, the, the episodes of season seven and she was like, I want to watch the rest of it. So then we binge watched one through seven and now we're starting over again because she is, she's going through like withdrawal, not having to watch game of Thrones. So, so do you think uh, George R. R. Martin will actually finish it before uh, he goes to the, the, the writing paradise in the sky? I, uh, you know, I hope he does. I've read the books. Uh, I like the books. Uh, I hope he does. Um, I'm really interested to read book six and see how it parallels with the kind of the reveals, uh, that happened in six and seven with, you know, with Hodor and then obviously the, the, the R plus L plus J, uh, theory. And I, I want to see him, I want to see how he handles that as books because the, the books are, are different from the series. I think he got, um, this is just my speculation, but I think the series got so far away from him. And then you add what evolved from the TV version of it. Well, the, the, the seasons. And I think he, he's sort of written himself into a corner. He doesn't know what to do next. I suspect the, uh, the movie or the, the, the next season of the the series is going to play more than the book is. And he's going to end up writing the book to mirror that. It's my well, guess. Yeah. And he's talked about that a f- uh, several times. And, and um, the, one of the things that he says was the TV show is not the books. Um, and, and, and you can kind of see where it diverges. It diverges more in season three. Season one and two basically mirror the books uh, pretty, pretty uh, religiously. Once you get to season three, it starts to split a little bit. And then four and five, it splits a little bit more. So I don't think that it's going to affect his writing because I mean, people loved his books way before the series started. Um, and I think those readers are going to want to read his version and his story and they want to see what he had in mind. So I, I don't think he's going to have a problem with that. His problem is just actually writing uh, yeah. <laughs> but just because he does so much. I mean, he's not a very fast writer anyway, from what I understand, but he does so much pub- publicity and he uh, on these tours and, and everything that he's got going on. He's I mean, it's engaged like, with the fans. Yeah. And like me, like I, I work a full-time job. I have four kids. I'm married. Um, uh, I wake up at 4.30 every morning and I'm generally in front of the computer by 4.45, 5 o'clock with my eye half open. Um, and t- typically I try to get you know, 2000 words in, uh, in a day. Usually I don't, but I try to, uh, and then on Saturdays, uh, Saturdays or Sundays, depending, I have a four hour block of time where that's specifically dedicated to writing. And so, uh, I've managed with, with, uh, bloodlines, I managed 50, uh, I have a running word count and then I have an actual draft word count. My running word count is so 56,000 words and I've deleted some of those. Um, but I've done that in a month. Um, That's not bad. So, yeah. So with George R. R. Martin being a full-time writer, being what he is, his books are like 450,000 words. So, I mean, it's going to take him at my pace. It would take him at least a year to write that maybe longer, but at his pace, I mean, he's been working on book six for like three years, four years or something like that. So who knows, right? Yeah, definitely will be interesting. So last question before we wrap it up, just because I'm fascinated with all the writers that also are veterans. So uh, how does your police and, and military, we'll combine them together, although they're not entirely the same. How do you feel like that influences your your writing and the stories you tell? Um, okay, so like out in the military, that that – that will affect uh, the, the way you present the military. There's a, there's a lot of people that write military science fiction that don't present it. in in my opinion, a true and accurate fashion of how the military would present. Like there's a, there was a book I read. I don't remember which author and I don't remember what that book is called, but I started reading it. The first chapter, basically this uh, rating is basically like giving the captain lip about something. Uh, you know, and the captain is asking him about something and he gives the captain attitude. The captain is taking it. it. Right. Exactly. And, (laughs) and, and and he's, you know, the rating is coming up with all the excuses on why this didn't happen and why this is wrong. And, you know, completely not no military bearing at all. 
uh, no respect for the chain of command at all. And in the military, you guys know it's very rigid. I mean, it's not like civilian life. Civilian life and military life is very different. If you have a civilian job, even in law enforcement, uh, I – I in law enforcement and, and we're paramilitary, but I joke around with my chief. I joke around with the DC. I say things to my captain and my sergeants and my lieutenants that I would never dream of saying to uh, officers in the military, just because there's that big of a, a gap and a, that big of a difference between enlisted and officer. Um, and so I think one of those are the, one of the things that you really need to pay attention to if you're, if you really want to write military science fiction and write it well and have people enjoy it is you need to respect and kind of understand the limitations and uh, the atmosphere that goes in with that. So I think being in the military gives me that, that little advantage um, being in law enforcement. I think the greatest thing that being in law enforcement gives me is just a, a huge, a uh, palette, if you will, of people to choose from to to observe and see how people act on a very visceral and real level. It's not watching CSI on TV. It's not you know meeting somebody, uh, you know delivering a package to somebody. If you work for UPS, which is great, like I I love UPS because they bring all my stuff. <laughs> <Amazon, but. laughs> Work working in law enforcement, you see every type of person, right? And you you in, interact with every type of um, financially uh, financial level, uh, personal level. Uh, you deal with Democrats, Republicans. You deal with you know atheists. You deal with uh, people that believe in God. You believe, you deal with poor people, rich people. The demographics are re- every every demographic you deal with. So I am able to take that from my work and roll that into my characters. And like I said, huge character guy, right? So I, I will take something from here and something from there and put it all together. And, and I try to create very real and very human characters. Um, and I, I think that, that having access to that, those demographics of people really help. Me do so that. quick question. Cause I didn't know. So the readers might not, can you tell us what a DC is? That's not a term I'm familiar with. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So, um, uh, in, in our rank structure, you have officer, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, uh, deputy chief and okay. chief. And so DC is, is deputy chief in some, some places they're called colonels, uh, ours are called deputy. Chiefs. All righty. That's, uh, that's definitely, I, I no, no, totally no, it happens. We do it too. Um, and then the last question I had for you is the, um, or not really a question. We just thought it was kind of interesting when, when, um, Chris and I were plotting out and we wanted our character to, you know, have certain characteristics, but we wanted him to have all this, this sort of high speed training. We thought about you and, and Scott both being police officers. So we're making our main character start off as a police officer in honor of you guys. Uh, very so, awesome. Now very you're going to be cool. pressured to read it. See? See what we did there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm like, JR, that's wrong. And JR, that's wrong. And just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? So, uh, yeah. We, we ran a little bit long on this one. We don't normally, uh, for the listeners, we, we generally we're going to try to keep it to an hour, but we were just having so much fun, and it didn't really have any logical place where we could cut it. So we're going to roll with it, and we hope you understand. But uh, before we let you go, Josh, can you tell people where they can find you? Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm active on Facebook. Um, Josh Hayes, you can search it. Um, I'm not very active on my Josh, Hay- Josh Hayes author page. Um, but uh, where I'm most active is uh, Keystroke Medium. If you search Keystroke Medium in, in Facebook or on the internet, we're the only one there. Um, we have a group and we have a page. Our group is very active. Um, our website's keystrokemedium.com. Uh, I have an author website, joshhayeswriter.com, but I haven't posted on that blog in like two years. <laughs> and all of that will um, be in the show notes. Uh, mo- yeah. So I, I interact with most, uh, most, most people on the Keystroke Medium group page. Um, so that our group, sorry. So, uh, that would be the best place to, to get in touch. Do they need a super on. secret decoder ring to get into that group? No, no, a- anybody, anybody can get in. Outstanding. So they don't have to drink their Ovaltine. I love it. So, uh, Chris, yeah. do you want to tell people where they can find us? Sure. Our website is www.sf, that's Sierra Foxtrot shenanigans.com. And our Twitter handle is at SFS. That's Sierra Foxtrot Sierra underscore show. Or you can reach us by email at podcast at sfshenanigans.com. 
Outstanding. Well, thank you for being a guest and for helping us out on this podcast, Josh. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Chris Winder, I'm J.R. Hanley, and this was the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of space and all things that go boom.